So the uh, first question I saw here is uh, uh, what could you tell about the deities of Olympus? Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Demeter, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Ares, Aphrodite and Hephaestus and Hermes. What kind of beings are they? What are they responsible for? Um, what can be a human experience? Uh, to uh, how can you get in contact with them? Do they manifest today? And isn't their impact smaller nowadays? <coughs> well, um, to properly really understand the, um, uh, the gods, you really have to look a little bit at the, the evolution of, uh, of deities. Um, what you see is that as uh, humans move into next stages or start working with new things, um, out of the cosmos there are uh, teachers are created. And what we see is basically that um, uh, humans used to live yeah, pretty much animal-like. In the Stone Age they were just uh, hunting and gathering and um, slowly they started to build agriculture, to build cities <coughs> and when they started to do that they started to work with crafts, they started to work with pottery, with stone, with metal and um, the society started to become more complex and the uh, Greek gods are very much powers um, who helped us with this transition um, so if you look at the, the geographical region of Greece, uh, what you find is that the, the first gods were basically um, um, basi there were matriarchal societies um, who were worshipping uh, the earth and the, the feminine. So they uh, were the worshippers of giants and the bee queen. And <coughs> Um, this uh, society was basically had only one god, they considered themselves to be part of the earth, part of nature, and that's all they needed. And the second phase um, uh, we see is that um, when, we, uh, when the person started to develop more uh, individually and more perso personally, so instead of just being part of the group and doing what is necessary of what is needed or what is right, they started to develop their own feelings, their own instincts. Um, so the first stages of individualization and specialization started to occur. And it is in this phase that they started to work with the Titans. And the Titans are basically the planets. The and the Titan and the Titaness were basically uh, pairs who were uh, ruling every planet. And as we know, all our energy bodies are made up of, out of these planetary energies. And they started to learn how to work with themselves, how to work with their male masculine side, how to work with their feminine side, and uh, how to be like a complete and harmonious human. So the first step was basically to get an inner harmony and uh, after the phase of the Titans then came the phase of the Greek gods. So basically if all would have gone perfectly humans would have learned um, <coughs> that uh, uh, to be in harmony in, uh, inwardly, to really know themselves and to be able to transform themselves to the wishes of their spirit and then it became to an outward role and this is actually where the Greek gods come in because they help us to learn how to manifest in the world so if we start from the top um, here we have uh, Zeus um, Zeus is considered the, uh, the king of the gods, very much the old father so in a way also the Greek gods are very linked to the gods of the uh, Nordic tradition, so in, in Scandinavia and in uh, Germany. Uh, very similar roles, very similar principles. So um, Zeus is uh, seen as the old father. Um, he's very uh, adventurous. Um, he's also very keen on, uh, on the women 
and um, he's also uh, in a way reflecting uh, the good sides and the bad sides of leadership. So in some ways he's a very good leader, in other ways he's a very bad leader, a very cruel leader. And all these gods basically are uh, dual natured. Uh, so you can't really say that uh, God is only evil or only good, but um, because they try to teach us about working with a force, and the force itself is neutral. Uh, but the Greek gods themselves, they are very much there uh, trying to help us, trying to help us to grow, to uh, move forward in the world. So you could uh, consider them to be part of the, of the cosmos of light. Um, um, Hera is, is the queen of the gods um, and they both have a lot of power so it's very much uh, the masculine power and the feminine power and the, the other gods are in a way lesser manifestations of like that power or combinations of that power um, Poseidon of course, the sea, uh, Demeter, the earth, um, and Apollo, the sun. Um, basically, these three show the main elements in the, in the Greek world. The sea, the earth, and the sun. Um, Artemis is, uh, is the moon. and She's also considered, uh, in a way, a lesser goddess. Um, but she used to be a major goddess. Um, because Artemis is the, is the sister of the sun, so she is the, the moon goddess and she is the goddess of the wild places, while Demeter is the, in a way, the goddess of the, of the tamed earth. Um, the harvest, the, the fields, with Artemis being the goddess of the wild earth. Um, Ares and uh, Aphrodite, the brother and sister of love and war. Um, if you look at the, the Assyrians, they combined it both in, uh, in one form in Ishtar, the goddess of love and war, but the Greeks decided to split it up in, in two forms, with war being, uh, being male and uh, uh, Aphrodite, the love being female. Later also, um, uh, these different gods became again linked with the planet, um, and so the original planet cult didn't completely disappear, but it's kind of fused with the, with the Greek gods. And as the Romans took on the, the Greek gods, uh, they also gave uh, Roman names to these gods, which are actually the, the names we use for the planets today. Um, Hephaestus is, uh, is the forger, the lords of the volcanoes. Um, and Hermes, uh, the messenger of the gods, together with Athena, who is the goddess of wisdom, the god of... And this is actually a very interesting combination, because Athena, Hephaestus and Hermes are the ones who actually make something. Um, there's later also lesser gods and goddesses and demigods, like Nike, the goddess of victory, um, Hercules... Um, and uh, many heroes, of course. And um, what we see as a very big difference is that um, people are looking for a role in society, so they tend to pray to a god or a goddess who will help them to take that role. So if you want to be um, yeah, a leader, you would choose uh, Zeus or Hera uh, as the goddesses who, uh, who will guide you. If you want to be a warrior, you would choose Athena, if you're a strategist, or Ares, if you're more a hands-on uh, warrior. Um, for healing, you can uh, work with Apollo, who basically has a lot of uh, power, or you can work with Hermes, who carries certain, uh, yeah, certain energies to you, who is more of a, of a knowledgeable healer. And here we see a very interesting distinction uh, starting to happen. That um, uh, instead of just doing something, you can choose to do. And you can choose to do with force, with strength, 
or you can choose to do with, with wisdom, with thought. And this is also the start of a little bit the division also between the light and the dark cosmos where you can start in a way to, to manifest your control, your power, your dominance uh, if you go towards the dark cosmos or you can uh, try to work in the most skillful, the most perfect, the most harmonious way possible if you're more attuned to the light cosmos. Um, so you can't just say that Ares is of the dark cosmos because he manifests direct power and Athena is of the light cosmos uh, because it is very much raw power, raw energy um, but it does give a preparation to go into the light or into the dark cosmos depending on whether you uh, develop your skill as much as your strength uh, because as I've said before if you only develop your strength then the strength tends to yeah, become dominant and uh, control you um, so as to what kind of beings are they um, in a way they are very much the, um, the manifestations of, um, of the wishes of the, of the people. So people have a need, people have a wish and in a way as an answer to that, uh, to that wish uh, gods and goddesses come into being. Uh, as I've said before not all gods and goddesses are uh, there to serve humans and often some gods and goddesses have dual roles. So Poseidon was also taking care of the other creatures in the sea and uh, Artemis is also taking care of other creatures in wild places. Um, the mater also takes care of, uh, of the cattle and the domesticated animals. Um, so there's, a, there's still a little bit of an overlap between the uh, gods of nature and the gods of culture. And if we move on in time to the Nordic religion which came after, there you see that already the gods of the humans and the gods of nat the natural world have split. In a way, uh, there you have very much the, uh, the Aesir, the gods of the humans, and the Vania, the gods of, of the natural world. But here there's still one, and also in the Egyptian pantheon there's still one. Um, if you look at the, the, the genesis of the, of the imagery of gods, um, it's, it basically was brought along uh, because there was a lot of trade in that time um, so there were uh, influences from Africa, from Egypt, uh, from also from uh, uh, the Middle East and all these tribes they moved, they traded with each other and so just like you see in Christianity the gods took over or took on a lot of aspects of gods of other cultures. Uh, so the Greek gods have elements of the Egyptians, of the Assyrian, of the Babylonian gods. Um, so the kind of beings they are. Um, a god is, is basically um, a formless being. They exist in, uh, in a higher cosmos above uh, the, the race which they serve, so they're not part of us. And um, they communicate through the archetypes. So in a way the, the warrior or the king, which are shown by uh, Ares and Zeus, it, this is not them, this is just the archetype which they use to, to show themselves, to work on the collective consciousness of the human, of the human race. And in a way this is how they also function. They don't work primarily one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, their idea of working with people is in a way to transmute the collective consciousness of the, of the humans, or of the animals, if they serve animals as well. Um, and what, uh, in a way, uh, such a god uh, does or wants is in a way to, uh, to create disciples. It wants to um, teach people uh, all they know so that they reach their, their full potential. Um, so they work a lot with talented individuals um, like people like uh, Sun Tzu or Alexander of Macedonia, 
Alexander the Great, um, but also with, with poets, with uh, artists, with philosophers, uh, with priests and priestesses. So they try to elevate the level of knowledge of, uh, of humanity by creating teachers and inspiring these teachers and developing these teachers. And these teachers in a way become more and more one with their chosen deity and they become more and more manifestations of the deity. So instead of just being a human who leads their own life, um, you can become a servant of that god, uh, a slave, you can also say, of that god, of the purpose of the god. So you become a teacher of wisdom, or uh, a teacher of strength, or a teacher of love, or a teacher of healing, by working with these various gods. Um, and uh, ultimately you can move on, so in, after, if you take human births again and again and again in service of, uh, of that deity, uh, eventually you don't have to remain human anymore. You can also become formless, just like the God does. And uh, in a way this is what happens to uh, people who become demigods. Uh, they serve the God so much, they become so one with them, that ultimately they become also formless and immortal and in a way uh, they become lesser gods or servants of the, of the same principle in their own right. Um, so as to the human experience um, in contacting them. Um, Often the, the, uh, uh, the experiences were very similar to uh, what we know from the voodoo as uh, cheval. Uh, cheval is horse and the priest or the priestess tries to be uh, the horse on which the, the god is mounted. So they would in a way seek to relinquish control over their thoughts, their emotions, their energy bodies to the god or to the goddess. So that there's really a fusion between like the earthly body, which is human, and some of the earthly consciousness and the divine impulse, which is riding it, which is influencing it and transforming it. So the earlier priests and priestesses were um, often used trance, um, they used uh, dreams, uh, they had visions. Um, and uh, in this way they were instructed by the gods and used as tools by the gods. Um, also in, uh, for instance in Dionysus, the, the, the god of the, of the wine and the dance, um, also alcohol was used and it is also quite uh, probable that also other um, intoxicating materials were used. To, uh, to create a greater surrender of the human to the deity. Um, so the, the experience of being, of being cheval uh, can be different depending on how deep a trance you will, you will go into. If you go into light trance you will just hear a voice or uh, you will get a certain knowledge or a certain feeling or a certain intuition. It will be a rather gentle uh, influence. If you go into uh, half trance, then you will notice that uh, some other power takes control over your body, and um, it will be like like seeing everything in a dream. So you see yourself, you hear yourself talking, you see yourself doing something, but uh, it is very hard to remember um, once the experience is gone. Um, and in full trance you don't ex actually experience anything, you're just being uh, removed from the body or pressed in a very small part of the body while the god or the goddess is working. Um, so there's very little experience. Um, what is known is that basically by being possessed by a god or a goddess, um, the, the human body can do things which are normally impossible. So it will gain greater knowledge, greater strength, uh, greater skill. Um, and in a way what the god or the goddess is doing by imprinting its power or its skill on the, on the host, uh, some of it will remain. 
so that the host will have some residual knowledge or some residual, residual talent or will find that his own talents are, uh, are stimulated. Um, so these joinings are basically uh, yeah, like taking food, uh, uh, spiritual food. Um, so how do they how do they manifest today and is their impact smaller nowadays? Um, yes, their impact is smaller. Um, basically also because um, uh, humans have found other ways uh, to teach, other ways to learn. So uh, in the Gabriel era, which uh, lasted until a few hundred years ago, uh, people were basically being guided, were being taught by the higher world. Um, so gods and angels and other beings came down to humans to instruct them what to do, how to act. Um, but now we are, we've become uh, We've come into the Michael era in which we seek to develop ourselves, to teach ourselves. Uh, so now we learn by logic, we learn by experimentation, um, we learn by uh, just uh, yeah, trial and error, <laughs> we learn by reading books, we learn by imitation, uh, we learn by inference, extrapolation, so we have a lot more processes uh, rather than just yeah, being put through the paces and trying to remember a little bit of what happen, happened to us. Um, and because of that, basically the gods are stepping back a bit more uh, to let us learn in our way. Uh, they haven't given up on their purpose or their goal. So if we as a human being seek their guidance or desire their guidance, they will still answer us and work with us and help us. And it is also still possible by following the tutelage uh, to reach uh, a higher state, to become indeed a servant uh, of them. But uh, the focus is moving on uh, to other solar systems where uh, such ways of learning is, uh, is still needed. Um. <coughs> So their impact on, on us human beings is definitely smaller. Um, if in a perfect world we would have uh, learned enough from them, learned how to, uh, how to live harmoniously, how to grow harmoniously, and um, uh, we would, uh, yeah, in a way have all the skills they, they teach us. They, we would have the skills of leadership, how to work with our masculine, our feminine side, how to work with love, war, uh, wisdom, healing, uh, uh, messages from, uh, from other planets, uh, from other beings. Um, but it turns out that we haven't been very good teachers, uh, uh, very good students uh, for, uh, for these teachers. Um, so, and now we have another way of learning. Uh, which is in some ways more easy, in some ways more difficult. Um, because especially if something is relatively new or we are, get caught up or things get twisted, become disharmonious in us, it is very good to turn to these gods and goddesses to, uh, to ask them to help you to sort things out again. Um, also the gods and goddesses were in a way uh, replaced by uh, by saints and by angels who will also have very specific domains of in which they teach humans in which they help humans um, so in a way the gods and the goddesses are often uh, working together with uh, with saints and with uh, with angels or uh, or with egregores so it's very common in the higher part of an egregore to find the influences of gods and angels and saints and enlighten people. Um, so we do focus a lot more on, on working with an egregore these days than with a singular deity. Um, and this is also because we define ourselves very differently. Instead of just learning the power, like how to be a warrior, how to be a leader, 
there's not much more about the goal. How do I, what do I want to do with society? And this is the ultimate. And to change society, you can act like a warrior or a priest or um, a healer or an artist. Um, so we are in a way expected to already have mastered all these all these skills, which we are now using to uh, to serve a higher ideal. So what are the relations of the deities of Olympus with Jesus Christ, Michael, Sophia and Maria? Um, so um, with Jesus Christ, uh, not very much. In a way the, uh, the Olympian gods, uh, also the Nordic gods, they, are, they were conceived in a pre-Christian era. And um, they serve to, uh, yeah, as I said before, to teach us to, so to, that we can harmonize, we can develop our skills. And uh, Jesus Christ is a much later phase. It is about uh, using all this knowledge and all these skills to create uh, uh, yeah, a society which is based on love and on compassion. Um, so they kind of cooperate or they kind of, they don't, uh, collide, they have no argument uh, with that, but they're more neutral in a way. Um, they're about the power, not about how to use the power. Um, they leave a lot of freedom for people to choose to, to follow Christ or not. Um, so working with Christ is also not a, a blockage for working with the deities. Um, it is important though that not all deities are light and if you want to work with uh, the power of Christ which is focused on love and compassion then certain deities are more difficult to, uh, to work with or because they're more associated with the dark cosmos but um, there's no forbidden. Uh, there's basically yeah, too much distance for them to be really in, in the same area or in, in, in conflict together. So it, it combines rather well. Uh, Michael is, well, is really about a very different phase of learning. Uh, the name Michael uh, uh, literally means he who is as God and this is basically our, our attempt to be more God-like. Um, so the Michael impulse is related uh, a little bit to uh, just like the Gabriel impulse to uh, uh, to uh, to Christ, um, whereby we can see Christ as an example uh, of how to be a perfect human, how to be a godlike human. Um, so Michael, in a way, is is a new teacher uh, who's yeah moving us towards a new ideal, a new goal, and. Um, in a way you can see Michael as a god himself um, because he's also there to teach us in this uh, transformation how to unlock our inner deity, our inner power. So Michael is very similar actually to the, uh, to the Olympian deities. Uh, but the thing is that it is not focused on one specific role like an Olympian deity but it is actually trying to bring you back to your original role. What were you in heaven? What type of angel were you in heaven? And that's the type of human you have to be and in preparation of becoming that angel again. So it is, uh, Michael's teachings are essentially the same but on a much higher level than that of the Greek gods. Um, Sophia? Um, Sophia is very much uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the Greek uh, culture. You could call her a little bit the meta-goddess. Because all the gods together, and not just of, uh, uh, of the Greek uh, uh, culture, but also of the other cultures, they contribute in knowledge, in wisdom, in skill to the collective consciousness. And this is basically the essence of Sophia. So Sophia is in a way created or formed by all the gods and the humans who, uh, who learn from the gods. Um, so Sophia itself is uh, 
you couldn't say she's a she's a god because um, she's not a higher principal or a teacher in that way. In a way, she is opening up again all the knowledge of the, of which has already been developed by the humans. <coughs> and um, helping us to integrate it into our lives. So it is very much the memory of, uh, of the humans, of the earth, um, uh, it's the Akasha Chronicles. Um, so Sophia is, is a very beneficial power. And in a way um, she also works with, with all traditions. So she works with the Christian tradition but also with pagan traditions. Uh, with shamanic traditions uh, to open up again all this knowledge of what has been before and she also tries to help us to integrate and to 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 increase that knowledge so she's very much uh, part of the the consciousness of the of the human collective ah maria um Yes, well, when we come to Maria, this is a, always a very difficult question. Um, because Maria, in a way, in her role, has assumed uh, the position of a lot of feminine deities. So she's considered to be a, a deity of the earth, of fertility, of marriage. Um, so she's, in a way, acting um, as Hera, as... Uh, Athena as Aphrodite, um, in the same way uh, as uh, Kuan Yin uh, does so in the, in the Chinese and Buddhistic cultures. And um, it would be very correct to say that Maria is a goddess, um, because she's very much um, uh, in a way channeling that power out of the unformed cosmos into the lives of individual humans, uh, which is very typical for, uh, for a goddess. Um, but she's also in a way more passive than a goddess. Because um, while the, the lesser goddesses are very active in, in teaching, in instructing, uh, Maria is often a little bit more passive. Uh, also because Maria and the Maria worship was conceived in a much more patriarchal society. We currently have a much more patriarchal system. And what we see now is as slowly but surely the, the feminine powers are reawakening. Uh, people are starting to work again with, uh, with Isis cults, um, with worshipping Hecate, um, with working with Hela. Um, and I think that uh, ultimately people will also start to work in a more active role or ask uh, out of Maria that she also becomes more active in, in teaching and helping in developing. Um, but in a way much of the knowledge, uh, uh, the gaining of knowledge is now done in a very masculine way. And uh, working with the, with the old gods is much more in a feminine way. So people used to surrender, to open up, to be sensitive to their energies, which is a very feminine perspective. And our system of, uh, of learning, of you know, teaching ourselves, developing ourselves, is a very masculine system. And until that balance is restored in humans, I think also Maria will have a slightly uh, more passive role. So I will now go to the last question because my throat is really sore. <laughs> um, what are the relations of the deities of Olympus with the Ship of Fools? Um, well, they really like the Ship of Fools um, because there are many people who are uh, interested in, uh, in learning and developing themselves in many different ways. They want to become leaders or, or teachers or creators or healers. And uh, wherever there is a school, uh, these gods tend to go there to, to work with them, to develop them. Uh, this is not just true of our school, but they also go to universities and other institutes of higher learning where people are devoted uh, to, uh, to self-development. So the, um, uh, the Greek gods 
are um, also present in, uh, in many of the agrogorts, which are also used by the school. Um, so they work both in a direct manner and an indirect manner. And usually they prefer to work, to work through the agrogore. Um, because the agrogore uh, in a way contains humans and humans have been initiated in the agrogore so the humans can also manifest the teachings by talking about it, by reading about it, by writing a book about it, which is more the modern way of, uh, of learning. Um, so the, the, the gods are very active but they tend to work through the pawns, if you will, which are within the, within the agrogore. Okay, so are there any questions? Um, I see a nine written by Lizzie, but that's not a question, I guess. Okay, no questions. <laughs> okay, um, so, oh. Okay, um, one of the things I would like to do then, if there are no questions, is to, uh, to pray together with you. So I would like to, uh, uh, to do a little prayer um, to, uh, to Artemis, if that's okay. Um, because Artemis is, uh, is the goddess of the moon, uh, and also as the goddess of the moon she's very much about sensitivity, uh, about magic, about mystery, about uh, nature, and um, uh, also about the signs which come from nature. So the, 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 the language of the birds, uh, the, the, the voice of the trees, uh, and all kinds of uh, divinations. And as such, uh, working with Artemis um, as a gatekeeper, uh, she also helps to open up, to open you up to messages which the other gods are, are in a way planting in your life, are creating in your life. So within the Ship of Fools there's also a tradition of trying to uh, look for your chances of spiritual development, uh, to find the places where the, the, the vertical world and the horizontal world um, coincide. And Artemis is a very important goddess to, uh, to help us to find these, uh, these places. So make yourself comfortable. And Try to empty your higher chakras. So allow all the energy from your head, from your throat, from your heart to flow back into your belly. So breathe to your belly. Let all your consciousness and life force gather there. So you create space in a way of void for the goddess to come to you. You can close your eyes and reach out in your mind to whatever wild animals or wild places there are in your neighborhood. They can also be further away. So places which are still relatively untouched in the mountains or in the deserts, in the swamps, where the harmony of nature still exists. And try now to find in this nature which you're seeing in your mind's eye, the place with the most light, the greatest purity, the 
greatest beauty, greatest harmony, and go on a journey to find Artemis, to find the natural temple. When you are in this place, imagine that you lie with your belly on the ground and your back to the sky and allow the day turn into the night and the full moon to rise and to shine on you. Feel that together with the moonlight, the power of Artemis comes over you and into you. But if there are still things in you which block it, give them to the earth. Release your pain, your fatigue, your thoughts to the earth and open yourself up to the heavens. That when Artemis has come into your body, feel yourself rise up from the earth and to look around you with the eyes of the goddess, look through her eyes and see the world as she sees it. See all the energies in nature, the voice of the birds and of the plants. And see that through nature all the gods are talking to you. The entire cosmos is talking to you. The waters are talking to you. Feel the great flow of energy, the ocean of energy which is all around you. And learn again how to be part of it. Allow now your own energy in your belly to become active under this guidance, under the guidance of Artemis. Let energy slowly be invited upward into your chest, to your eyes, to your nose, to your arms. To claim again your birthright as a human being. Because we're also a wild animal, as well as a conscious, rational being. And give thanks to the goddess for her help and her teaching, and helping us to remember our strength and our wisdom and the wisdom of the world. Thank you, great goddess. Always be welcome. Thank you for the harmony, healing and wisdom which you have shown. sign off now and I will let you enjoy 
this feeling for a while. It's good to recall this every once in a while when you're out in nature. Um, so you can benefit more from the contact you have with it. Okay, I will do the rest of the questions uh, hopefully uh, next week. Okay, bye bye.